I guess we will go ahead and get started. Um, this afternoon, this topic from 1 to 2.30, or 1.30 to 2.30, is to talk about the heart of the matter, cardiovascular concerns and Turner syndrome. And um, I'll tell you, who are we? So um, I'm Dr. Jeannie James. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and the medical director of our cardiovascular genetics clinic. And here is Dr. Nicole Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown has trained in internal medicine and pediatrics, as well as pediatric cardiology and adult congenital heart disease. Um, in our cardiovascular genetics clinic, we have a multidisciplinary group of three cardiologists, uh, one nurse practitioner, three genetic counselors, and one geneticist. And together we take care of patients with cardiac problems who also happen to have a genetic disorder, such as Marfan syndrome or Williams syndrome or obviously Turner syndrome. Um, I'm one of, oh, sure, I can try talking better. How's that? Is that, okay, <laughs> thank you. That's well, well said, <laughs> point well taken. So. Um, I am one of the physicians who takes care of pedi pe pediatric age, pediatric age Turner, Turner syndrome patients, and Dr. Brown takes care of adult patients. And that transition is somewhere usually between 18 and 21 years of age. So if you come to the pediatric side, you would see me or one of my colleagues. If you come as an adult, you would see Dr. Brown. So Turner syndrome, I don't think I have to tell you guys what Turner syndrome is. Obviously, uh, this is what we call a karyotype, which is when you're looking at the genes that a person has, and normally um, you would have two X chromosomes, but with Turner syndrome, you only have one. Um, and their patients with Turner syndrome can have a wide variety of different types of genetic footprints or karyotypes. Um, but for the purpose of today's talk, I'm not gonna break down into mosaic Turner syndrome versus sort of a, a full-blown Turner syndrome. I'm just gonna call Turner syndrome or TS. Um, just for short. So this um, is a cartoon drawing of the heart, uh, just to sort of show you what normal anatomy looks like. So we have, there's four chambers in the heart, two chambers on the right that conduct blue blood out to the lungs, and then two chambers on the left that conduct red blood out to the body. Um, and there are walls to keep the red blood and the blue blood from mixing, so normally no holes in the heart. Um, and this works to, to take the blue blood from the body out to the lungs where it gives off carbon dioxide, takes up oxygen, becomes that bright red blood that we think about coursing through our bodies, and then um, exits from the left side of the heart out to the body. Um, of a particular importance with Turner syndrome is the aorta. That's the major artery that leaves the heart and that conducts the blood out to our body. So if somebody feels your pulse, they're feeling blood that has been pushed through your aorta. Um, and there are um, the aorta has... a, a it's lots of specialized names that we call the sinuses of Valsalva is part of the aorta that's um, the closest to the heart. And then the heart kind of, the aorta makes kind of a candy cane. It sends off some branches to your head and neck, and then it dives south and goes down towards the lower part of your body. And normally there should be no obstruction anywhere in this pathway. So with Turner syndrome, approximately 50% of Turner syndrome patients will have some type of heart defect. Um, and the, uh, the most common uh, problem is uh, 10 to 15 percent will have a narrowing of the aorta called coarctation of the aorta. Um, about 30 or 40 percent will have an abnormally formed aortic valve, and we'll talk a, a bit about each of these. Um, about 15 percent will have an abnormal conduction of the pulmonary veins coming back to the heart. And just uh, for review, the pulmonary veins are bring the red blood from the lungs back into the heart. So um, some patients with Turner syndrome will have an abnormality where all these veins don't go back where they should. Um, and then a few uh, paternal center patients will also have an extra systemic vein going back to the heart. And I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. Um, major defects in the heart and blood vessel development really result in a high mortality rate for fetuses with Turner syndrome. And you probably have heard that or have, are aware that um, many fetuses with Turner syndrome don't survive to birth. There's a high rate of miscarriages, and it's thought to be due to major defects in the heart and the blood vessels. So we're gonna talk about the different types of heart defects that patients with Turner syndrome can have. And we're gonna go from the most common to the less common. Um, the most common heart defect with Turner syndrome is a bicuspid aortic valve, or a BAV for short, because bicuspid aortic valve is a mouthful. I mean, this is actually present in about 2% of the population. So a lot of people have a bicuspid aortic valve. It's present in about 30 to 40% of patients with Turner syndrome. Um, 
it's often silent in that you really, there's often not much in the way of a heart murmur or any symptoms from having a bicuspid aortic valve. And a lot of people, you know, there may be even more people in the population that have a bicuspid valve, but just because there's not much in the way of a murmur, you don't really hear it and nobody thinks to get a study to look at the heart. Um, just having a, a, a ordinary bicuspid aortic valve usually doesn't require much of anything um, in terms of surgery in childhood. Sometimes with a bicuspid valve, you can get um, significant narrowing of the valve, which would cause blockage to the heart, or a lot of leakage of the valve, which might send you down to needing a valve replacement early in life. But that's typically um, doesn't happen. Usually they're silent. Um, kids and adults with bicuspid valves lead normal, healthy lives. They exercise and they do just fine. Um, but what is important to mention that with the bicuspid valve is it um, not just for the Turner Center patients, but for the general population is surveillance because of the concern that you can get dilation of your aorta related to this bicuspid valve. These are just two pictures kind of showing what a normal, a normal aortic valve would look like. Normally, you'd have three leaflets. This is kind of as you're standing in the aorta, kind of staring down and looking down the pipe. You would three, see three leaflets for the tricuspid valve. Um, in a bicuspid valve, there's only two leaflets. You can kind of see in this cartoon sort of shows where there were these two leaflets here fused together to form a single valve. And I had some lovely movies, but they're not playing. <laughs> so what happens with the, with the normal valve, when the heart squeezes, the valve leaflets get pushed out of the way, and the blood exits the heart just fine. If you have a valve that's bicuspid, it won't open up all the way. It kind of domes, maybe makes a click, which is a, a sound that a doctor can hear when they listen to your heart. And you might hear a little bit of a murmur just because the blood is going through a, a bit of an abnormal region. These would have been really pretty movies, but the, the PC is not cooperating with us. So this was just going to show you how the, how the valves open and close. So that's a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, less common in patients with Turner syndrome than a bicuspid valve is a, a condition called coarctation of the aorta, or coarct for short. And this is a narrowing of the aorta as it courses down the spine. So I, I showed you that picture, that the big wide open candy cane. A coarctation has a narrowing down here, kind of beyond, right around the place where these vessels branch off to go to your head and neck. Um, so it's, it's present down this, this area. Um, occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of patients with Turner syndrome, and it's usually diagnosed early in life because these are babies often that are not sick. You can imagine if you have a blockage here, everything down below is not going to be getting blood, and the heart is having to work extra hard to try to pump the blood. So most of these um, babies present quite early within the first few weeks of life. Sometimes patients can have much more subtle narrowing. So they have some narrowing there, but it's not enough to cause a, a problem with the heart. In that case, the, the diagnosis not, might not be picked up until the patient is um, substantially older. Usually coarctation does require a surgical repair, especially in the newborn babies that show up with this. Um, if it's a more mild form, a lot of times what we will do as cardiologists is watch them and make sure their blood pressure is okay and, and check and make sure the heart's not suffering from having to pump blood through a narrowed area. Um, but there's surgical techniques. There's actually also cardiac catheterization techniques now that can allow this to be fixed in certain patients without even having to have a surgical incision. So there's lots of options kind of depending on what's going on. This is a really interesting one I've had to explain to people in clinic. It's a long word, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. We call that PAPVR for short. Um, and um, this, this is a cartoon showing normal, um, the normal anatomy where the, all the veins that bring the red blood um, from the lungs back to the heart come here to the left side of the, of the heart. Mm. Partial veins, or PAPVR, is usually, um, there's one of those four veins that doesn't make the blood back to the left side, but brings it to the right side instead. So you can, it's kind of drawn here. Here's a, this shows uh, all this blue blood going out to the lungs. This is a heart with PAPVR, where one of those pulmonary veins is, is bringing red blood back into this blue side, and they kind of color it purple as a way to kind of show that the, the red and the blue are mixing. Um, this is present in about 15% of Turner syndrome patients. The good news is that it almost never requires surgery, um, and that's because the amount of blood that's, that's coming back to the wrong place in the heart is really quite small. Um, we notice it, we, we take note of it. If you have a cardiac MRI, a lot of times that's the only way we pick it up because sometimes on echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart, we can't see that too well. But it's, if you have that, it's one of those, well, we'll have it, we'll keep an eye on it, but we probably will never have to do anything about it. And then the last um, heart defect that is uh, common in patients with Turner syndrome is called a bilateral superior vena cava. 
So normally we have one large vein that conducts the blue blood from the top part of our body to our heart, and one large vein from the bottom that takes the blue blood back to our heart. Um, but actually some, t some people will have an instance where they have two veins in the top that take the blue blood back to the heart. So they have, a, it's called the superior vena cave, and normally we have one on our right, and it drains here. Um, about 15% of patients with Turner syndrome will have one on their left as well. And it drains down and kind of comes behind the heart and then dumps into the same right side. So this, this is blue blood and this is blue blood and it's all mixing in the blue blood chamber. So it really doesn't cause any problems. It doesn't cause a person to be, you know, be a blue baby or anything like that because all the blue blood is going back to where it should. It just, you just happen to have an extra, an extra blood vessel there. And we see this also in patients without Turner syndrome. And it, it's one of those findings where we say, hmm, that's kind of interesting, but the good news is we're not gonna have to do anything about it because it's not conducting blood to the wrong side. Um, and it would be really, really rare to actually have to fix that. I can't think of anybody in any recent time that we've had to, to do anything about when it comes back in here and mixes with the proper side of the heart. So um, this slide was just to kind of talk to you a bit about what the um, outcomes are for patients who have Turner syndrome and who also have congenital heart defects. Because you might wonder, well, if they have Turner syndrome, are they at higher risk for their cardiac surgeries? Um, and the answer is generally the outcomes for surgeries um, in patients with Turner syndrome are just about as, really pretty much as good as with patients who do not have Turner syndrome. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the, they do tend to have a longer length of stay after an operation. It probably a lot of it has to do with some fluid. I mean, you know, as you know, some pa patients with Turner syndrome can have problems with swelling, and that can be a problem postoperatively. Um, so the patient may need to stay in the hospital longer, but if you look sort of one year, two year, five years down the road, the patients are doing just as well as patients with a similar operation who did not have Turner syndrome. So it might be a little rockier right there in the hospital, but then but the outlook's really, really, really good. Um, the exception to that is a very critical lesion of the heart, which I didn't talk about because it's quite rare. Um, it's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, basically where the babies have only two chambers of their heart instead of all four. Um, and this is, this is a, an incredible challenge even for patients without Turner syndrome. Um, but, but Turner syndrome plus hypoplastic left heart syndrome is particularly difficult to manage. Um, HLHS, or hypoplastic left heart syndrome, is diagnosed within the first three days of life. So you don't need to sit there and wonder, ooh, do I have hypoplastic left heart? Because, you know, you would have been diagnosed as a newborn. So um, that, that is the exception. But in general, if you have to have heart surgery and you have Turner syndrome, you should do just as well as anybody else. Um, there are some other findings um, that go along with Turner syndrome. Some patients can have some EKG abnormalities, and there's a, a you know, this is a, an EKG. Basically, what this does is it, it just measures the electrical activity of your heart, and it looks at it from different places across the body. So that's why we have a whole bunch of different looking tracings here. Um, there's a, a wide variety of benign findings in patients with Turner syndrome. Um, for example, they may have a uh, slightly higher resting heart rate, which might even be noticed um, as a fetus. Um, and this may be an intrinsic problem in the self-regulation of heart rate and blood pressure, um, which may, and the, 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 the system in our body that does this is called the autonomic nervous system. You kind of think of it as the automatic nervous system. It's what kind of keeps us breathing and our heart pumping and such. And so um, this uh, slightly higher resting heart rate might be related to just an intrinsic um, problem with patients with Turner syndrome and regulating those types of things. Um, more significant EKG abnormalities is something called prolonged QT interval, and this may be present in perhaps as much as 35% of Turner syndrome patients. So I have an on and off switch over here to kind of to help explain what this is. So normally when, when, you, um, when your heart squeezes, there's been electrical activity that's fired through your heart that causes your heart muscle to squeeze. And you can think of that as being the on switch. Um, and then the off switch is when the electricity has to go away and allow the heart to relax and to be ready for the next blood to come back, you know, the next beat to come along, and that's the off switch. So a QT, your QT interval is this part here. This is your QRS. That's when your heart is contracting, and this is when it's relaxing and going into the off phase. Um, a prolonged QT interval means that, the, that the, it takes longer for the heart to turn off the electricity, so it takes a bit longer for it to reset and be ready for the next beat that comes down the road. Um, Patients who have long QT interval might have, may have some symptoms such as palpitations, your irregular heartbeat, um, fainting, um, even sudden cardiac death due to a chaotic heart rate. Because you can imagine if, if your heart's trying to beat in a regular fashion and, then, and, the, um, and it's taking longer for this off switch to functionally work, then the next beat that comes along might, um, could kick you into something that's very unusual and it can make you um, have a very uh, chaotic heart rhythm. 
in um, you know this prolonged QT interval is is in general a very genetic type of um, defect. Lots of people without Turner syndrome will have genetic defects that cause them to have problems in this on-off regulation. Um, in Turner syndrome, we don't really know quite why it, this is a pro you know why this appears to be an issue, except that it might get back to that autonomic nervous system and kind of a dysregulation in how the automatic functions of, of the body is not totally regulated normally. Um, this this uh, EKG, pro, or the prolonged QT interval, is something that we would diagnose on an EKG. So if you go to the cardiologist and somebody puts lots of stickers on your chest, they're taking a look at this. Um, another concern um, with uh, Turner syndrome and the heart is something called aortic dissection. Um, that's where you can get some dilation in your aorta that can cause the heart um, the aorta to weaken and then um, can actually, because it becomes so weak, it actually develops a tear. And you can imagine that would be a catastrophic thing if you develop a tear in the major artery in your blood vessel. Um, it's, it's uncommon in Turner syndrome patients, but we do see it more commonly in the Turner patients who had um, coarctation of the aorta or aortic valve disease, or if they had high blood pressure that was not being treated or, um, or pregnancy, for example. So these types of things can make um, a dissection um, a bit more, a bit more common, um, and then it can also occur in patients with Turner syndrome who have a totally normal heart. And Dr. Brown's going to talk some more about that. Um, presently, there is a registry that um, is being that's collecting information on patients with Turner syndrome who have a dissection of their aorta because it is it's a rare event. But you can imagine this is not something we want to have happen to anybody. Um, and so, um, so there is a registry trying to trying to figure out more about why um, why do we see this. So um, rather than help you, you know, have you guys sort of think this is all doom and gloom and gosh, there's all these bad things that can happen to you, I, I just would like to leave you with some ideas about ways that you can actually make things better for yourself. Um, you know, when, when patients have um, Turner syndrome, we do recommend um, some screening tests. So they need to have an echocardiogram done at the time of their Turner syndrome diagnosis. Even if the fetal echo, if there was a fetal echo that was done before the baby was born, they still need to have one after birth because we can miss some things on the fetal echo. Um, and we do that to look, to, you know, to, to really to assess the anatomy of the heart, to make sure everything connects back the way it should, to take a look at the aortic valve and make sure it's opening and closing properly, make sure there's no coarctation. Um, and then when the patient's older, usually teenage years, we like to get a cardiac MRI. And what um, I, I wrote here, when the patient's old enough to hold still, because you have to lie still for a while when you're in the MRI. If anybody here who's had an MRI will attest to the fact that, yeah, I've had one too. I was in the study, and I got a little claustrophobic in there. It, I uh, <laughs> almost had a panic attack. It was not pleasant. Um, but, but we like the MRIs because sometimes you know, with ultrasounds, we're trying to bounce sound waves off of structures that can be deep in your chest. And the deeper it is in your chest, the worse, you know, the, the grainier the pictures are that come back to us. So we can't really see things so well. But MRI gives us a beautiful look um, at the aorta and all the surrounding structures, which when we're monitoring patients with the Turner syndrome long term is what we're really mostly concerned about. Um, other things you can do, you know, you want to, you know, you want to live healthy, right? Watch your weight, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, because all of these things can add, you know, on top of, you know, you, you couldn't pick your genes. You got Turner syndrome. That's what you have. But you can modify your lifestyle and, and make healthy choices for yourself. And that's actually, you know, one of the, the big important things um, to do, because we do know that patients with Turner syndrome um, have some other problems. And I'll talk a minute about that. Um, other surveillance things are so regular imaging studies. If we see some dilation on your aorta, we're going to want to watch you more closely. Um, we have to consider what size of an aorta is too dilated because it depends on how tall you are. Obviously, if you're not a very tall person, your heart's going to be smaller than someone who's quite tall. And so we have to take into your into account your heart and your heart your heart size and your body size when deciding if your aorta is too big or not. If, we, if the aorta is dilated, we opt with medical treatment to try to protect that vessel. Um, if it gets too large, then we re recommend surgery to replace it. Yes, there's a question in the back. Well, it, it depends on the side. I think Dr. Brown's gonna talk about that. I know she has a slide about that, so I'll let her address that. <laughs> Um, in terms of exercise recommendations, so if you have a normal heart, there are no limitations. You can go and do anything you want. If your aorta is dilated, we will um, advise against doing isometric exercises such as weightlifting or bodybuilding um, and no competitive contact sports because you can imagine if, some, if you've got a dilated aorta and somebody crashes into you on the softball field, that, that blow to your chest, um, if your aorta is weakened, can be very dangerous. So um, no competitive contact sports. 
But the hardest thing about exercise is that some motivation is required. And maybe it's the T-Rex, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So that's, that's why I want to kind of give you a little more information about some of the other problems with Turner Syndrome that maybe will help motivate you a little bit. Um, patients with Turner Syndrome have, uh, sadly, have an unfavorable, what we call cardiometabolic risk. And we're not sure if this is intrinsic just to Turner Syndrome or whether modifiable risk factors contribute, or it's probably a combination of the two. Because, you know, in a woman, ovaries produce hormones that are very important for cardiac health. And if you don't have normal female hormones being produced, you do become at risk. Um, we do know that patients with Turner syndrome have a two-fold risk, so two times as much risk of developing coronary artery diseases or, or blockages within your heart, arteries, um, and that carries a three-fold mortality risk. So you, you know, right off the bat, just having Turner syndrome, you're sort of into this higher risk group, which is part of the motivation of, of really trying to make yourself as healthy as you possibly can. Um, so here in a modifiable risk factors, you know, this, your blood sugar is incredibly high, but and again, you are a jelly bean, but you're not a jelly bean. You can, we can modify your risk factors with this. So um, things that you can, you modifiable are things you can change. You can change and work on your blood pressure, your weight, your blood sugar, and your cholesterol. You can't change your age, your gender, or your family history, or the genes that you have. So you really want to work on these things that you can modify. Um, so, you know, blood pressure. Um, yeah, it's all fun and games until your genes don't fit. So it's important that you, that you really embrace a healthy lifestyle. Because in, in Turner syndrome, there's a problem with glucose metabolism. So normally if you eat a meal and your blood glucose goes up, your pancreas makes insulin and brings your glucose back down. Um, in patients, you know, we, we actually know that about 35% of young girls with Turner syndrome have impaired glucose tolerance. They may not actually have full-blown diabetes, but a lot of them will have um, problems where, they're, where their body is not able to put out insulin to, or the insulin is not active in the right way to bring the blood sugar back down. And, you know, as compared to, you know, 35% of Turner syndrome girls, only 8% in control patients. Um, type 2 diabetes is four times more common in the Turner syndrome patients, and it, it appears that the insulin secretion that your pancreas kicks out and also how effective it is at lowering your blood sugar changes at different stages in your life. So there may be times in your life where your blood glucose is fine, and then later in life it may not be as fine. Um, and we don't really understand why, why this is, but we um, clearly need to have more studies done. Um, body composition in Turner syndrome um, is is you know, it's not just due to the shorter height that patients with Turner syndrome have, but um, adult patients with Turner syndrome have a higher fat mass. They have a lower lean body mass, so that's your muscle mass, increased visceral or abdominal fat. You know, and abdominal fat is the stuff that's the bad actor in terms of insulin activity, insulin function. And we, and we, see, you know, we, we see these things in adults with Turner syndrome, and we're seeing um, similar trends in girls with a higher waist circumference and, and you know, less um, lean body, less protein, and less muscle on their, on their back. So, so really, I think you know, childhood presents a great opportunity for early detection and intervention in girls with Turner syndrome because it's a lot easier to get out ahead of, um, ahead of the problem. We also know that in addition to problems with, um, with coronary artery disease and glucose, they can also, patients with the Turner syndrome can have um, high lipids, high cholesterol. So about half of Turner syndrome ages 21 and above will have high cholesterol. Um, we also know that young teens with Turner syndrome can have high cholesterol as well. And this is kind of a cartoon showing the, the bad cholesterol, LDL, and then the, the good cholesterol, which is called HDL, that kind of comes and sweeps up the, the stuff that will block your blood vessels. But, you know, even in very young patients with Turner syndrome, there's you know, cholesterol abnormalities. And so, you know, when you, um, and, then, and then sort of top it off, patients with Turner syndrome often will have high blood pressure. And blood pressure is like the force that your blood exerts on the walls of your um, arteries. And you can imagine if you've got a dilated aorta, something that's going to increase the force on that is not something that's good. We want to make sure we keep that under control. And we know that about 50% of adults with Turner syndrome need treatment for high blood pressure. Um, and about 30% of Turner syndrome girls have mild high blood pressure if we do a 24-hour monitoring. Um, and what's really also quite interesting is um, typically, normally your blood pressure will be higher during the day. It will drop down at night. Um, they call it the nocturnal dip. It goes down at night. Um, patients with Turner syndrome don't tend to have that dip, and we don't know why. That kind of goes back to that automatic nervous system and how, we, how our bodies normally regulate our blood pressure and, and heart rate and such. But about half of girls with Turner syndrome will not have this normal day-night variation. So there's something intrinsic in the system that is kind of skewing things towards the high blood pressure side. Um, 
And the, the, you know, so what this means is that basically before a doctor or a nurse can take your blood pressure in your arm and say, you've got high blood pressure, there are actually um, a period of, of time where your blood pressure is not being regulated normally, but nobody has picked up on it yet. So when you, you know, when you consider the problems with glucose and insulin, high blood pressure, um, cholesterol issues, ovarian failure without the um, female hormones, um, and body composition, that can all lead to damage to your arteries. Um, and which can, you know, sort of make things like aortic dilation worse and can lead to aortic dissection. So that's why we really, you know, these are types of things that, that you can do things, you can, you can modify, you can do things about. So I'm here to tell you that it's never too early <laughs> to develop healthy habits um, in terms of exercise, uh, you know, a, a combination of aerobic exercise and core strength, and I saw you have yoga on your program, so you really should go do that yoga because it's awesome for you. Um, and also, you know, a healthy diet. You can't, uh, you can't start too early with that because these are things you can change. And I see somebody's hand raised in the back. That's, that's a really good question. The, the, the studies on that are mixed. Sometimes, at some point it thought that it looked like it was good and it was going to help fix all those fixed problems with that, and then other studies came out showing that it doesn't. So I think, I think the answer is we don't know yet, and you know, people want to, to study it a little more deeply. Sure. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Brown. So I'm just going to uh, reintroduce myself since some people came in late from lunch, and that's totally fine. I'm happy to see so many people here. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Uh, so Dr. James is a pediatric cardiologist, and um, I trained in pediatric cardiology, but I also train in adult um, congenital heart disease. So primarily I take care of adults born with heart defects. That includes Turner syndrome patients, and it also um, includes patients who are at risk for aortic disease, like Turner syndrome patients. So. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the adult side of things, but you're going to hear some repetition, but repetition is sometimes good because it'll help you remember it later. So um, in adult women with Turner syndrome, whether you're newly diagnosed with Turner syndrome as an adult or whether you were followed as a child, either way, we need to see you. Um, in the newly diagnosed Turner syndrome patient, uh, you need to be screened for the first time for cardiovascular disease, just like you're being screened for the first time for uh, diabetes and cholesterol issues and all sorts of other things that come along with Turner syndrome. If you were diagnosed with Turner syndrome in a, as a child, uh, we still need to continue to monitor you um, because there are some late cardiovascular complications. So obviously if you had a severe coarctation of the aorta or if you were a rare case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome or some of those other things, you would have known that when you were a kid probably. But there are some things like a bicuspid aortic valve that might be silent that you might not actually find out about until you're older. Um, and so it's really important to, be, to avoid being lost to follow up. And um, I could preach a lot about being lost to follow up because it's not just a problem with my Turner syndrome patients, but it's also a problem with all of my adults who are born with heart defects. Because when you're a child, your parents or your caregivers are taking you to your appointments and you might tune out while they're listening to what's going on, the doctor is saying. But as you come to be a teenager and as you turn into an adult, you have to take ownership of that yourself and you have to start kind of paying attention to what, um, what's important for your uh, medical health. So um, it's important to just remember that uh, these things continue on into adulthood and we need to continue to see you. So just to recap, uh, the most common things that we're seeing in Turner syndrome patients when it comes to the heart and vascular system are uh, bicuspid aortic valve, okay, Jeannie showed you a picture of that, coarctation of the aorta, which is the narrowing, and let me see if I can get the pointer working here. So uh, the bicuspid aortic valve would be here, okay, E, all right, the coarctation, is represented by a letter D up here, okay? And then you can also have just sort of an, it should sort of look like a candy cane, okay? But sometimes you can kind of get this sort of flattening out of the transverse part of the arch, and that's not uncommon either. Uh, sometimes the head and neck vessels come off in abnormal ways, and, um, and the aorta obviously can be dilated, and that's something that can happen um, even as you get later in life. So that's one thing to watch out for. Now, hypoplastic left heart, like she said, is abnormal, but obviously a very important thing to manage uh, the anomalous pulmonary veins. So that means those couple, one or two veins that might come back to the heart um, via a different route than they're supposed to. Might make the right heart dilate if there's a lot of shunting, but usually not enough to require surgery. 
and then an extra vein coming from the left side of the upper part of the body. Okay, that's the left SVC that she mentioned. And then uh, we didn't talk about this one, I don't think, and this is less common, but it's also kind of a normal variant even in people without Turner syndrome, and that's called an, an aberrant right subclavian artery. So the artery that goes to your arm, instead of it coming off over here, it comes off over here and wraps around to get to that side, okay? So that usually doesn't require any intervention. It's just something to kind of know about. So those things in this picture here, and obviously if you have a complex defect like a hypoplastic left heart, those are what we really need to keep an eye on as you get older. Um, so what is congenital heart disease? Um, I'm not sure if this is a term you've been hearing in other parts of the meeting, but congenital basically means that you're born with it. This is as opposed to acquired heart disease, which is something that you develop over time, maybe because of uh, just as a part of getting older or maybe because of bad habits that you've had. Um, so as she said, congenital heart disease occurs in up to 50% of girls and women with Turner syndrome. It's the leading cause of morbidity, which is uh, basically illness, um, hosp needing hospitalization, that sort of thing, and mortality, which is uh, death, and requires lifelong surveillance. So again, the message of don't get loss of follow-up as you become an adult. Um, and how frequently you need to be seen and uh, what types of studies we need to do depends somewhat on the type of uh, heart defect that you were born with, if you have one, and the severity of it. Um, and ideally, you should be seeing somebody who's trained in a congenital heart uh, disease setting who knows not just about coronary artery disease and um, high blood pressure and things that you develop when you're older, but knows something about defects that you can be born with. Uh, because those are two very different training pathways. Um, so acquired heart disease, as she said, primarily we're looking at hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Uh, again, up to about 50% of Turner syndrome women are requiring treatment for that. Um, you need to be screened for your blood pressure at least annually. Uh, this can be with your cardiologist, but also it can be with your Turner syndrome doctor, whether it's your endocrinologist or geneticist or whoever you might follow with. It could also be with your primary care doctor. Um, and then one thing to consider, as she mentioned, is the 24-hour blood pressure monitor. So what that is is just a monitor that you wear at home for 24 hours and you usually have some sort of packaging that comes with it that you mail it back, okay? That gives us a report as to what your blood pressure does during the day and during the night in your normal setting. Because sometimes when you come to clinic, your blood pressure might be high, but that might just be because you're nervous to be at the doctor. And we call that white coat hypertension. Uh, sometimes we're big, big, bad, scary doctors. We try not to be. Um, so uh, we want to know what your blood pressure does in your normal everyday life. Um, and because of the risk of dissection, which is the tearing of the aorta, blood pressure requires aggressive treatment in Turner syndrome women. And then, as she mentioned, atherosclerotic disease, which is coronary artery disease. So that's the type of disease that people get plaques in their arteries and they might need a stent or a bypass surgery when they get older. That's what that means. So the risk factors leading to that are obviously high cholesterol, diabetes, and perhaps the estrogen deficiency associated with uh, Turner syndrome. So. Again, a recap, this is a blown up picture of what she sh showed before. So aortic dilation mostly occurs um, in the root, which is that early part of the aorta, which is where your coronary arteries come off. Those are the coronary arteries are what give blood to the heart muscle itself, okay? Those are the things that get clogged when you have a heart attack. Um, and then the ascending aorta, which is literally the part that ascends. It goes up from the heart towards the he head and neck. And then the candy cane part here, that's called the transverse arch, and then the descending aorta, okay? You can have dilations in other parts of the aorta, but typically it's in that rising part of the aorta. And then a dissection is when that uh, part of that wall tears, okay? The blood doesn't usually leave the vessel itself. It kind of leaks in between the layers of the wall. And so it's important to know as an adult, because that's when it's most common to have a dissection, is it's very rare to have a dissection in a turn syndrome patient, we think, younger than 16. Almost all cases are uh, later than 16, and we'll show a slide later that kind of shows uh, what the age range is. But the symptoms of a dissection is something you should always kind of review with your doctor and also know if I think I'm having a dissection, where do I go? So it's very common in young people to have chest pain, and most of the time chest pain is not cardiac in origin in a young person who doesn't otherwise have risk factors for heart attack and that sort of thing, okay? So dissection pain is not usually pain that you're gonna mistake for something else, okay? Dissection pain is the most rip-roaring pain you can possibly imagine, kind of tearing through your heart, sometimes kind of tearing through your chest to your back. So a lot of people actually have back pain. Um, so if you have that kind of pain and it persists, and especially if you feel dizzy or short of breath um, or like, like you're going to faint with that, you should go to an ER. You should go to an adult ER if, if you're an adult um, because that's where they're most used to dealing with those acute types of tears in the aorta. 
okay? Um, now, that is opposed to some, like, if you have twinges of chest pain here and there when you take a deep breath or after you've had a cold or something like that, those are typically not concerning types of chest pain. Still talk to your doctor about it, but I wouldn't worry as much, as much about those. Um, so we care about dissection because it's the thing that's going to affect you most because it can be fatal. Um, it has a hundred, it's still very rare in Turner syndrome, but it is a hundredfold higher risk than the general population. And it occurs much earlier than it would if you weren't a Turner syndrome patient. Um, it also can occur um, at a smaller diameter, a smaller size. So that's why we have to watch and we monitor for that dilation and we look for risk factors like high blood pressure and do you have coarctation and do you have a bicuspid aortic valve. So this graph, you don't need to know the details of it too much except for to say these are the age groups of Turner syndrome on the bottom. On the far right there is the total population, okay, the general population. And then on the left, or the uh, y-axis, is uh, the aortic dissection per 100,000 patient years, okay? So in the median, in the general population, non-Turner syndrome patients, the average age of dissection, uh, median age of dissection, I'm sorry, is 77 years. Okay, one second, I'll finish this slide and I'm gonna answer your question. And then the male to female ratio is two to one. But in the Turner syndrome group, we know that in your late 20s and in your 30s, um, and also somewhat into your 40s, this, this is when you're at highest risk. So much younger than 77 years of age. Yes? Um, I have a question about the last uh, earlier you mentioned that Okay. This one? So on, on that point, I think that's a very good point to make. I will say that I do often counsel patients, not just with Turner syndrome, but with Marfan and other patients that I see that are at risk. Marfan patients are sometimes easy to pick out because they're really tall. Some of you guys are short, but some of you guys who have growth hormone, you actually, I've seen Turner syndrome patients who are taller than I am because I'm 5'4". So <laughs> I, I think sometimes it's more obvious than others. So if you're not rolling into the emergency room with that type of pain and you're not with, a, with that type of pain, but you're not with a loved one who can tell the ER doctor, hey, my daughter has Turner syndrome, um, how are you going to alert them if it's not obvious to them? Well, one way is to wear a medical alert bracelet, and somebody's showing us an example of theirs back there. Thank you. Um, and she's got one too. Excellent. Um, so a medical alert bracelet or a necklace that you can kind of most of the time keep tucked in if you don't want the whole world to see it, um, but that if, when they go to take your shirt off in the ear, they're going to see it. Um, if you're really humorous, you could get a tattoo or something like that, but um, a bracelet that's removable is perfectly acceptable. Um, so, yeah, some way to alert people, even if you're unconscious, that uh, Turner syndrome, risk of dissection, Turner syndrome, risk of dissection. So they know they don't waste time. If you're in there unconscious, they're going to get you in the CT scanner and they're going to get you to surgery, okay, because the speed is, speed is of the essence. Okay. Um, so uh, as she said, I'm going to just recap this too because this is important to know. So dilation and dissection risk factors, the things that are going to make dilation and dissection more of a... Um, a concern for your doctor in your case is if you have a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, people with bicuspid aortic valve, even those who do not have Turner syndrome, because remember bicuspid valve is very common even in the general population, have a risk of aortic dilation. So when you combine the fact that just a bicuspid aortic valve can make you have a dilated aorta, just Turner syndrome can make you have a dilated aorta, these are at risk people, okay? Uh, if you had a prior uh, narrowing, which is the coarctation of the aorta, uh, where you kind of on that Remember on the side of the candy cane, you had to have that fixed um, if you have high blood pressure. Um, but remember that dilation and dissection, um, especially di this percentage here is for dissection, can occur even in the absence of structural heart disease or high blood pressure. Uh, so there seems to be some underlying what we call vasculopathy or a vessel disease, something that's abnormal about the vessels in Turner's room that predisposes you to having a dissection even if you don't have some of these other risk factors. But risk factors are things we can watch more closely for and manage. So I'm going to just briefly talk about pregnancy because I think pregnancy is a much larger topic than I'll have time to discuss in one session and I'm probably not the only person to talk to you about it in terms of your endocrinologist and whatnot. But it's obviously rare in Turner syndrome, but if you've had the appropriate workup, there are ways to sometimes carry a baby, okay? We have some concerns about that. One, because just the data is small, okay? So we don't know a lot about it because there's not very many cases of it, for one thing. Um, there's some conflicting evidence, even in the non-Turner syndrome patients, as to whether or not pregnancy is a risk, for, risk factor for dissection 
uh, for women in general, okay? Uh, some studies have shown that it is, and um, certainly in, when, that's a catastrophic event when that happens to a pregnant woman. But some studies have shown that those women that were pregnant that had dissections actually had other risk factors for having a dissection and that maybe the pregnancy wasn't the most important thing that um, led to that. So just kind of be aware that pregnancy may confer an additional risk for aortic dissection in women with Turner syndrome. Um, and that especially those who have the other risk factors that we already talked about. So that's really something that if you're even, if it's on your radar at all, you need to be talking to your doctors about it well in advance. Okay, so if you go to the cardiologist, what are they gonna do to you? Well, most likely they'll start with a blood pressure. Sometimes we do this in all four extremities or at least three extremities. And the reason we're doing that is if we don't know or if you've had a previous history of coarctation of the aorta, or if you might have one of those abnormal arteries that goes to the right arm that comes off uh, a different way, okay? Uh, but most of the time, we're gonna check your blood pressure in one arm. Um, I figured there would be enough women in the room to appreciate Mario Lopez uh, as an example of the cardiac exam. So the doctor's gonna listen to you with a stethoscope, okay? And we listen in usually at least four different areas, and because those four areas represent each of the valves that we need to listen to, okay? So when we're listening uh, for uh, the aortic valve especially, we're often listening here, and sometimes we'll hear the click down here too, but we're listening for the aortic valve a lot of times in this space here on the right. You're gonna get your pulses checked, uh, probably upper and lower pulses, so we check pulses in your wrists, which is your radius, and in your groin sometimes, and on your feet. And then you're gonna get an EKG, which she talked about, because sometimes you can have conduction abnormalities uh, with the heart rhythm uh, through the uh, electrical system of the heart. You might get an echo, that's the ultrasound, and you might get an MRI or CT, okay? Let's go through each of those. So echo is on the surface of the chest, yes. MRA, yep. Uh, angiography is the end of the term, so uh, magnetic resonance angiography, so it just means with contrast, basically. And, and it's looking at the vessels in particular. They're injecting dye and they're, lo uh, they're looking at the vessels, in especially um, the aorta, probably. Yeah, so they're often done in so when I place the order in the computer, I usually order MRI plus M MRA chest. So, yeah, they usually go together. Okay, so echo um, is the ultrasound technology or the sound wave technology. It's usually on the surface of your chest. Now, there are echoes that they do in your esophagus, but we're not usually doing those for you guys. The screening ones that we're doing are just the ones on your chest. It doesn't, it might be a little uncomfortable if they have to press around your ribs and stuff a little bit, but in general, it's not, it's not uncomfortable. Uh, MRI is the thing where you lay on the, uh, on the table and you go through the tube and that showed it and this, that was on the bottom right here. So this is sort of an, uh, what you look like when you're going through the MRI machine, okay? Uh, if you can't have an MRI because you've got some sort of, you've had some sort of surgery or uh, something that's contraindicated to go in the magnet because MRI is magnet-based technology, then you might be, need to have a CT to better look at some of those uh, blood vessels that we can't see by echo instead of having the MRI. The, we try not to do CTs primarily uh, because they do involve small doses of radiation, um, which, you know, for, you know, once here or there is fine, but if you were to have to have them serially from the time you're young until you get old, then that's a lot of CT scans. So if we can, we try to preferentially use MRIs um, to complement the echoes. So uh, the echo is really good at um, finding most structural heart defects. I'm gonna check the time here, sorry. I don't wanna go over on you guys. Um, so it's really good at finding structural heart defects um, within the four chambers of the heart. Um, it's really good at looking at valves. Um, it's good at looking at the heart muscle function. And it can see aortic dilation pretty well, especially in kids. Um, but as you get older and bigger, it's um, harder to see good echo pictures in an adult, okay? So we might get nice, beautiful pictures and see everything for the most part that we need to see in a kid. But in an adult, that can be really hard to do. Um, so we really rely on MRI or sometimes CT, like I mentioned, to look for the dilation of the aorta, to really see the entire candy cane of the arch. Um, we can also see the descending aorta, which we can't see very well and by echo. Um, we can see whether the veins from the body or from the lungs come back to the wrong places. Um, and we can see whether there's abnormal artery connections like to the arm. So the ones that were, the reason we're really um, uh, emphasizing MRIs, mostly because of the di aortic dilation and the arch abnormalities. Those are the things we're really mostly concerned about. And they have good, reliable, reproducible 
measurement. So if it's good to get your MRI in the same place every year with the same group of people interpreting it versus getting it pro scan one year, the hospital the next year, and trying to piece it together. Um, so in sc screening imaging for adult women, um, if you're newly diagnosed as an adult or if you've not had any imaging in many years or we just can't find your records, uh, we typically like to do both echo and MRI, though we might not do them in the same year necessarily. Um, so it's reasonable to start with MRI alone, um, but like I said, sometimes echo helps us with valve function a little bit more than MRI does. And if we can't do the MRI, then we might recommend the CT. Um, we also would recommend imaging at, at the time of transition to adult care if you haven't had it in a while, um, just because you're switching providers. So that way your new provider gets an updated look of what's going on with your anatomy and the function of your heart and whatnot. Um, and we prefer MRI if there was never one done prior. If you had echoes the whole time you, grow, you were growing up, then we would like for you to get an MRI. Follow-up imaging intervals. Um, depends on what we found initially and what we know about you from your history. Um, so if you have no significant structural heart defect, um, you have no valve disease, you have uh, no holes in your heart, um, you have no aortic dilation starting out, then uh, aortic screening is in an adult um, with an echo or MRI every 10 years. Now I, I do prefer MRI as much as possible. Um, whereas in kids with no underlying disease, um, just Turner syndrome, uh, we're coming up with every five years because you're in a growth phase, okay? Um, now, keep in mind, and I'm going to bring this up again at the end, but new guidelines are being developed, and so the, we'll go into the specifics a little bit more. I don't want to go into it too much today because we're actually still working on them. But if you have no other disease, you still need to get it imaged at least every decade, okay, as an adult. Um, and then... Prior to considering pregnancy, if that's on the radar, we would definitely need new imaging. And if hypertension is diagnosed, we might want to take another look at your aorta to make sure it hasn't dilated um, while your blood pressure has been elevating. If you do have aortic dilation or, uh, and or um, other dissection risk factors, um, such as history of coarctation, bicuspid aortic valve, those sorts of things, then the screening intervals and the modality, meaning echo, MRI, whatever, Needs to, needs to be more individualized. So that's the reason that it's good to have a cardiologist that's well-versed in congenital heart defects and um, Turner syndrome because those decisions need to be a little bit more um, per person, okay? So we have to keep in mind that dissection can occur earlier at smaller diameters, and um, if, you, if your cardiologist doesn't know that, then they might not do the appropriate screening interval for you. There are recommendations even in non-Turner syndrome patients of how frequently to image somebody with bicuspid aortic valve. But again, it depends on how leaky is the valve, how tight is the valve. So that's what I mean when I say it's individualized, because you might need to be imaged as often as every year, okay? Um, so aortic measurements, what qualifies as dilated? Well, we know we have to account for the short stature in Turner syndrome women. Um, so there are several proposed methods of what we call normalizing the size of the aorta to your body size. Um, but the most, and usually we're using body surface area. So um, uh, a little bit of math, I'm not gonna go through it, but this is the equation for calculating body surface area. Um, if you Google body surface area calculator, you can plug in your height and weight and you can figure out what your body surface area is. But in average, it's going to be about 1.6. Now, if you're overweight, it's going to be higher. So you might get a sort of a non-ideal body surface area uh, measurement if you're overweight. And then ASI stands for aortic size index. That's the most widely used index of how to account for aortic dilation, aortic size against your body size in Turner syndrome women. And there are some, there are some Turner specific measurements out there, but for the most part, um, you'll probably hear this term, and this is going to be represented again in the new guidelines that come out. So this is looking at your aortic dimension of your root, remember the early part where the coronaries come off, um, or the ascending, the part that rises, compared to your, uh, divided by your body surface area. So we're looking at centimeters uh, per meter squared. Okay, so we would consider anything greater than or equal to two centimeters per meter squared to be sort of in the mildly dilated to moderately dilated, at risk, need to watch closely, might need imaging more frequently type of range, okay? Um, if your index is greater than 2.5, then we need to consider whether or not you need to have surgery, okay? I'm not gonna say that's a hard stop, 2.5 go to surgery, because that's not necessarily the case, okay? The guidelines go through that a little bit more, but um, I think 
just to avoid confusion, just remember that these are the numbers that we're looking at. You don't have to ask your doctor, what's my ASI, okay? It's your doctor's job to worry about this, but if they don't know what ASI is or they don't know much about Turner syndrome, then that might be a red flag that you're not seeing the right type of person. Um, so surgical intervention for dilated aortas um, is gonna be, like I said, addressed more in the forthcoming guidelines, but um, the factors that affect surgical decision-making are what your aortic size is, what is the rate of growth that they've seen over your serial imaging scans, how old are you, um, do you have associated risk factors for dissection that they may need to have a lower threshold for considering surgery? And are you thinking about becoming pregnant? Because if you're um, dead set on becoming uh, pregnant or at least going through fertility treatments um, to try to carry a pregnancy, um, then we need to know about that too because that might be a net risk time for you. So in terms of medical therapy, pills, tablets, medications, um, there's no evidence for or against uh, specific medications to prevent aortic dilation in Turner syndrome patients. Um, this is an area that needs more study. We do have some analogous type of situations in other syndromic populations like Marfan syndrome, where we know drugs like beta blockers, which would include things like atenolol, metoprolol, or what we call angiotensin receptor blockers. That would be like Losartan. So if any of you are on those medications, those are medicines that are commonly used to treat blood pressure. They're also commonly used um, in patients who have a dilated aorta. So to some degree, we're sort of, we don't have enough information in Turner syndrome patients. So we're, we know there are some similarities, but it's not the same um, in terms of what the vessels look like. And therefore, we have to just use the best information we have and use the best medicines we think are available to treat your blood pressure and your dilated aorta. So it's considered reasonable to use those, but um, more than anything, you need to have high blood pressure treatment. Uh, I know Dr. James touched on sports and activity a little bit. There will be some of this information in the guidelines that come out as well, but your individual restrictions will depend on your age, your aortic size, uh, whether or not you have other cardiac problems um, going along with that, and what type of exercise you're wanting to do. Um, so, again, the guidelines are being uh, discussed more here at this meeting. Um, we hope that we're going to have a publication out within the next year and that um, all of you can sort of uh, have access to that and review it with your doctors and have, be a little bit more well-informed about what the consensus is amongst the experts of how to manage your cardiovascular risks in the setting of Turner syndrome. And we'll be happy to take any questions. supraventricular tachycardia? I, I haven't seen it as much, no. I mean, the QT prolongation, I think we do see more frequently, but the SVT, it, it might rarely occur, but I haven't seen that commonly in Turner's room. Um, uh, sorry, I think some, yeah, okay. We'll just kind of go around the room this way. So, um, as opposed to people who have what's called long QT syndrome, which is a genetic mutation affecting the conduction of the heart. Long QT syndrome um, has several different variants that run in families. That can be deadly, okay? Long QT in Turner syndrome patients has not been associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. That being said, it is considered, again, reasonable uh, to avoid medications that prolong the QT interval. So if you're, um, you know, the upper limit of normal for women is going to be somewhere around 450, uh, even up to maybe 460. I don't usually get too concerned unless it's really pushing, you know, 470, 480, 500, okay? So, um, and I might counsel that woman, you know, there are lists that you can Google of like certain antibiotics and things like that that you shouldn't take if you have a prolonged QT. But in general, we're not, um, we're not telling them that they're at an increased risk of death because we don't know that that's true. Um, there also is some mention that's probably going to be in the guidelines of whether or not you can what we call risk stratify. So if you have a prolonged QT, do you need to have an exercise test or a Holter monitor to see how it changes uh, with activity? Um, it's, a, it's not considered a thing you have to do. It's considered a thing you can do. But what are you going to do with that information? We don't know yet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. One more question. So uh, the QT interval changes based on your, your heart rate. QTC is uh, corrected for your heart rate. And so we tend, uh, QT uh, interval do change just in the general population with, um, with age. But for the most part, you know, from teenage years on, it should be kind of in the same range.
Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> All right, yeah, uh, and the flower shirt there, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh huh. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. They put in a, a graph, is that what you said? A background graph, okay. I'm, a, I'm, and I, I'm sure lots of you have individual questions. I'm happy to take those kind of at the end so we don't go over too much. But uh, it's not, if, if you have to have a valve replacement and you also have a dilated aorta, it's commonly done together where they're, they'll reinforce that part of the aorta that's dilated with something artificial. Um, and then the valve may also need to be replaced. But, um, but you do need to have cardiology follow-up for sure. Just because you had a surgery, if you, if you had a surgery that was corrective, corrective even if you have, had it as an adult, um, it still needs to be followed because sometimes they uh, can need to be reoperated on and things like that. So it's still good to follow with a cardiologist. One more question. Right. Um, well, I, I'm, I can't say off the top of my head that I know if there's been any studies of people who have been on beta blockers for decades and whether or not there's been adverse effects. I mean, the way beta blockers work is they lower your heart rate a little bit and they also will lower your blood pressure as opposed to the other drugs that we sometimes use like Losartan uh, that are uh, blood pressure lowering agents. Um, there are some effects on electrolytes sometimes that you have to be washed for, but rarely do we see an issue with it. Um, you have to watch your kidneys while you're on some of those medications. So. Any medicine that you're on needs to be monitored, but I'm not aware that there's been any uh, long-term adverse effects of people who are on beta blockers or, or um, ARBs, which is the other class of drugs. They're very commonly used medications um, throughout the population of Turner syndrome and non or mostly, you know, really more non-Turner syndrome patients. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's causing long-term detriment. If anybody else has a, a question, I know you need to move to your next session, but I'll wait up here for a few minutes. <laughs>